By the way, we're a small group, so if you have any questions or you want to add anything, I'm sure there's a lot of experience in this room. I know there is. And uh, so help out if you want to visit about something. One thing that uh, is real important, I've worked with uh, the ACO, the, uh, the uh, engineers down at the FAA, I've worked with them quite a bit in the safety program and different stuff, and uh, learned a lot about what aircraft do when they're out of, out of, uh, out of uh, the safety area in the load. With the aft load, an aircraft, with a heavy aft loader, if you get further you get aft, the controls get really light. They feel like, wow, we got power steers. They're really light, but they're very ineffective. And if the airplane would stall in that configuration, you may not be able to lower the nose enough to recover. So don't do big, heavy aft loads, you know. And heavy forward CG loads uh, can be a problem too, but they're not as difficult as aft loads. So. Um, and I recommend stall spin training and basic aerobatic training for all pilots. I, I did some, uh, first did some aerobatic training over in Hawaii and that was a good excuse to go to Hawaii and uh, did some flying out, out of Oahu. Uh, I did some, some folks there and uh, it was helpful, you know, and then I continued and when we set, we were waiting to get our air taxi certificate in Hawaii, we had a, a we sent over a 172 and a 152 Aerobat with a uh, Aerobat conversion that gave it a little more power and a better product and performed better. Because where we lived on the big island was 3,000 feet on the so and warm. So of course it was nice to have a little more power. And uh, but so we also had some beginner students, and I worked them through basic aerobatics before they ever sold. And uh, and they went on to be really good professional pilots and stuff because what kind of prop prop me into doing that? Two two young people were just getting ready to take their private ride and they were flying out of Kona. So they were out over the water down by Kona and uh, two different people with just in a few days, young men spun to the water and killed them. You know? And uh, I thought, wow, we need to work. These people need to be able to be aware of how to deal with the spin. A lot of people, spins are kind of alarming if you haven't when you do your first ones. And uh, people have a tendency to want to hold it. The, the nose drops radically and it starts dropping and spinning. It's, it's all, almost like a power steering kind of thing. And uh, so people want to aileron back out of the turn going in. And that makes the stall deeper. And if you hold the nose up, try to you know keep the nose from going down there, that holds it in the spin. So you have to break the stall, give it a little bit of, not a lot, but a little bit of forward pressure, stop the rotation, new, well neutralize your ailerons first, stop the rotation, and then recover slowly from the spin. And they're fun after you've done a few of them. And, uh, and you get used to them when you're doing a, quite a few of them, like I would. Uh, you know, you can tell right when it's ready to break. And once it breaks, it's real sudden. It just... And a snap roll is the same, but on a horizontal. You're, you know, you maybe have a little more airspeed, and you pull the, pull the yoke back and the stick back and stuff a rudder all the way to the floor and it 
snap roll, but really a snap roll is just a spin on a horizontal axis. But they're fun, you know. And then we used to do some snap rolls at the top of loops. And those could be pretty exciting too. <laughs> Especially with the student and you know, we try to work with them on that. Um, Seat belt adjustments, there was some, we had a couple of accidents where the seat belts were misadjusted and the latch to open the seat belt, and this was on float, were over on the side, and so the door was closed over the latch. And there was an accident down on the Kenai, and everybody got out of the airplane except for the pilot, and his, his seat belt was, <clears throat> somehow didn't get the door open and get it done before he drowned. So, something to think about. Um, also, we think that it's worthwhile to have sh shoulder harnesses in the back seats. Because, uh, every, why not everybody have a sh shoulder harness? And then there all, are also harnesses that have air, their airbags. And, uh, AM safe has them, but uh, I don't see that many of them being used. Um, and I'm not out rotating through, um, you know, doing uh, GA uh, briefings with airmen as much as I used to, but I don't think that they've been used so much, but they are available. One thing we know from some and a lot of accidents is helmets in cub-like airplanes, cubs and cub-like airplanes, and light aircraft of any kind. Uh, helmets are really helpful. They'll save, they'll save lives. And they, they have some really good helmets. The French had some really good helmets with headsets in them too. And they're nice to have, they're nice units. Um, and then we've, uh, there's been some accidents involving in float safety uh, where one in particular was bow damage. And you've, I've all, we've all seen uh, some float with an old tire on the front of it or something like that. And uh, not a good repair, but there's been some accidents where there was a lot of openings up in the front where there's been damage on the bows and uh, those front compartments can flood and that's just a bad place to put a whole bunch of weight. And another thing is, uh, so one thing that we noticed is when somebody goes in to annual their aircraft, chances are it's not on floats or not on skis it's just the airplane in the shop and they take care of the annual. But um, there can be there can be a lot of improperly rigged floats where the guy wires are either too tight or not tight enough or just not rigged well. And uh, another thing that's a problem is float lockers. A friend of mine was uh, had an accident out at Manchumina Lake. It was real windy and they were trying to get uh, get down to the end of the lake and take off into the wind in a 206. And uh, they were getting a lot of water up on the floats and the float lockers were not, not no gasket or no good seal down, no good lock down. And uh, they were filling up and he tried to turn the airplane and overturned. And they, one son and the wife, the son drowned, but the wife had an ear drowned. And he was in the hospital for some time. So uh, a lot of times I've seen uh, float lockers where they use bungees and uh, they'll open up and, and once you get over the top, they'll hold open, but then the bungees will close them too, but they're not sealed. They're not, you know, there's no, nothing to really 
hold them sealed and, and uh, they can load up with water and cause a big problem. The other problem we saw uh, a lot dealing with the Iditarod Air Force and stuff is ski rigging problems, where a lot of times uh, <coughs> skis will just have the thimble and the cable attached to a steel tab that's kind of sharp edged and uh, and you'll see that uh, that the thimble and the cable are fraying and ready to break. And uh, it would be better to have uh, a system where you had some very rounded surfaces for that to, to work on. And um, so anyway, uh, taking good care of your skis and your rigging and another thing we noticed is these skis, when they were STC'd or whatever, had a, a speed limit. You, know, you weren't supposed to go your normal, you know, highest airspeed like you were with your clean airframe. There are a lot, a lot of them were limited a fair amount. And we've seen situations where skis stopped because of overspeed or rigging brake, safety cables broke, and uh, it's been some real bad accidents. Uh, there was one over in Canada recently, it took a while to figure it out, but uh, it was uh, a turbine otter, and it was loaded up with supplies and everything, and it was going fast downhill. And the next thing we knew by the, uh, by, the, the controller's information is that it spiraled right down and crashed. And the skis probably tucked and uh, lost control of it. So. There was a 185, this is years ago, there was a 185 in Canada and uh, it had some sort of wheel skis on, I'm not sure what, what they were, but it had four big guys in it coming back from some mining camp or something and they were going probably quite quick downhill into, into their destination and uh, the, uh, the, the skis tucked and it took out the, uh, the door, the door post and that door post goes right up to the wings and uh, and it did it on, and then it did it on both sides. So the airplane came apart. The front of the airplane with the engine and the two guys in the front seats went that way. And these guys in the back seat went the other way. And by some miracle, the two guys in the back seat, that thing kind of floated down and went into a snowbank and they lived with minor injuries. But the other guys, of course, didn't. But anyway, it's important to keep, keep track of your skis and find out what speeds they sh should be the max speed for them. And they're supposed to be noted in front of the pilot too, so they can see them. Uh, the next morning, they were supposed to go flying with an operator in a 206 over to, I think, Coba and some other places and look at run, do runway inspections because they were airports people. And uh, the, I said, look out there. We can't even see, you know, two runway lights down the runway there. So you know better than to want to get in a VFR airplane and take off, you know. You use your sense, you know, you know that you know better and, uh, just because the pilot says he's going to do it doesn't mean you want to be on board. So think about that. Hey, Danny. Yes. You got any thoughts on uh, scud running and night flying? Well, um, <coughs> I've never scud run in my life. No. <laughs> uh, you know, when you're scud running <coughs> out through the country and the weather's really low, you don't remember that country. It looks all totally different. And uh, I remember one time I was coming back in 
into our base of operation at Snowshoe Lake with a beaver. And it started one of those real heavy fall snowing, you know, wet snow. And uh, man, I was only uh, maybe 12 miles away from the house. And I decided this isn't good, you know, and it was trying to stick on the wings to it. So I landed in this little no-name lake and uh, uh, pulled the thing up. And sure enough, the next morning I had snow and freezing snow all over that airplane. So I had to get up on the wings to clean it off, you know, to get ready to go. And I thought, man, if I fall off of this thing in the water, I guess I'll just have to hurry and <laughs> get, get, in, get in the airplane and go home. So scud running is dangerous, and uh, it's it's not even if you know the country really well. When you get right down with real low visibility, you don't know the country anymore. You know? And uh, I suppose that gentleman back in the corner there can tell us some stories about that. Uh, yeah, he has tons of experience in the Arctic and, and uh, flying all over. There. I'm sure he, he knows about that. Absolutely. Yeah. And then nighttime, uh, nighttime can be challenging too, um, depending on the type of uh, situation you have to get into. A lot of places where you're going and you have runway lights, it's not a big problem. But if you're late, I know one time uh, we had, we got a call in that this lady that we had taken out to this lake on the other side of the big Sioux from us was, uh, she was pregnant and she was extremely sick. Remember that, Patty? Mm -hmm. And it was already getting, I, I made it back with a load to Snowshoe Lake and it was already kind of dim, but uh, I took off for, for that location that was about it was over across the river from the Clements Lake. It was probably about almost an hour, you know, to get out there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I could see good enough to land in the lake. And an old bush pilot told me, when you can, if the wind isn't a big effort, land into the sunset, you could see more. You could see the water better. You could see so I did that and I got out of there with the sick person and uh, when we got back uh, to Snowshoe Lake, my bride had the vehicles parked on the end of the lake looking out onto the lake and uh, so I was able to come over and go real low over that area and then do a, a glassy water landing onto the lake and get fun. But it's not fun to fly in the dark when when you uh, don't have much help. <laughs> well, and I'd like to add, I don't think anybody ever, you know, flies at night in those conditions or scud runs on purpose. It's just something that happens when you're out there and uh, <clears throat> conditions go bad or it's an emergency. And yeah, actually that happened to us going into Nome. We were on the radios all day long. Oh yeah, come on in, come on in, and then the weather was real good. But yeah, changed real quick. The road out to Teller, <laughs> and I said, I kept looking at that road, thinking this would be a good place for us to land, you know, because uh, already we knew that it wasn't very good in Nome. We were getting ready to go over to Providence Bay, Russia, and uh, and. Uh, the weather just went down in Nome. But Marshall uh, did well. Uh, he spent his whole career as a flight service and flight service upper management. And he got a special and we got in on a special and hung right in there. But it, it was, and then the next day it was good. Mm -hmm. Except for the muskox. <laughs> we were parked out in front of uh, an operator's on the deal and we were checking the pre-flight in the airplane getting ready to go over there 
and I heard this ah, 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 and this big bull of muskox with a bunch of them with him <laughs> came right after us. We had to jump in the airplane <laughs> and didn't start it up or anything, just jumped in it. And uh, later, was that this year, a trooper was killed out there for some Yeah. Hmm. They're, they're serious. Well, let me make a comment too. I don't, I don't know how long this is going to go, but flying with Dan, he would always, you know, you think about judgment and learning. Uh, so I learned a lot from Dan and he uses his own judgment though. So he trusts, but verify. So he would check my ox tank out or make sure, you know, check the gas. He just, uh, I think that's what's contributed him surviving all these adventures he's had. Yeah, I, uh, I forgot to mention that, but I did get the award for uh, Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award for 50 years without an accident. And then I also got the Charles Taylor Master Mechanic Award. And Charles Taylor was a gentleman that built the engine for the Wright Brothers to be able to fly. And so I was pretty fortunate to get both of those. Both of those. So, pretty cool. Yep. So who else can add some information for us? I think uh, personally, you know, proper briefing. So like, you know, before you go anywhere, know the risk that you're taking before you go out and fly somewhere. Yes. Uh, whether it's like notams or if the weather's going to change. Um, the things that, that aspect, how much fuel you're taking, how much fuel you're taking, so you don't go into something that, you know, being surprised and not be any of yeah, and that reminds me of your personal, your personal minimums. What you think you can, you know, if you, what you can do, what kind of script you need, what you need. I think that's important to, to kind of figure that out. What, what works for you. Well, you you had touched on something earlier, and I don't know how many people here remember um, the plane crash. in my plane the other day, and two of those guys only weighed 145 each, so. Yay! <laughs> every, every to self. Huh? Yeah. Well, it did that time. Not always. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else have some ideas for us? I see you're thinking about something else. No, I was I was thinking about flat light and featureless terrain, especially as winter approaches, snow covered terrain. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was talking to uh, one of the gentlemen about flat light and helicopters, or he went out to do a check ride. But uh, I'm working on a, well, I have a patent, a, a patent for uh, flat light help, and uh, it uses 
uh, lasers that are, uh, the laser projectors are line projectors, kind of like what the carpenters use to level and stuff. But uh, they're on each side of the helicopter or the little airplane. And they, like out in front of the helicopter, about 12 feet out or so at skin height, these makes a, a, a cross right on the snow or whatever it is, makes a cross right there. And then um, when you take off, we tested it on a 212 helicopter down in the Canadian Rockies where they fly a lot of skiers up on the ridges there. And uh, afterwards, I uh, worked with the chief pilot and we tried this. I had, I had some of the small projectors that they used to use for just uh, safety flight. So you could signal an airplane. And they're not an eye problem because they're aligned. So they're less, less of a problem. And uh, anyway, we put them on this uh, 212 and right out in front was a uh, X in the, and it was snowy then, so in the snow. And uh, when we took off at six feet, it was just uh, re it was just like a reverse V. And then as we went higher, it came apart. So when you're coming back in, as it starts to come in, you know, you get an idea about where you're at, and it skid high. Boom, you're there. And it's visual right out in front. It's not trying to look at. A radar altimeter that may not work in 5G areas where there's 5G uh, cell signals, it you know, doesn't work well on a lot of them. But anyway, this is something that's simple to put on the aircraft and it's right there in front of the airplane, right in the flat line situation. So I'm pretty excited about it. Um, I had the, you know, I got the, the provincial and the patent pending, but then I, I just recently got the application in for the full patent. And then I'm going to try to get them approved for a NORSI approval that's a easier approval to put on airplanes because it's a safety item. So uh, remember when people were putting those uh, angle attack indicators on. They were able to put those on with the North Sea because they're pretty simple and they don't affect the flight of the aircraft and they're a safety. So I'm going to try to get this one approved soon so we can put them on, especially a lot of helicopters and medevac helicopters, little airplanes that are doing up on the glaciers. I used to fly a glacier, the state of Alaska glacier rescue school, and uh, these instructors were teaching people how to, you know, rescue people out of the crevasses and a bunch of stuff. And it was on the upper Taslina glacier, and it's so broad up there. Even if it was VFR legal flying, you didn't really want to be up there because it was so flat. Um, like w the friend that flies helicopters for uh, that was just here a minute ago, he said, when people are out in the area on the glacier by themselves, there's some people out there, but they look like they're floating in the air. You know, they, you, you don't know where they're at, as far as the ground. It's pretty dangerous. Uh, we were talking about that uh, helicopter accident in, uh, in Juneau in 99, three A-stars went up on, they were gonna go up on the Herbert Glacier, and I think that's where Libby Riddles was, had a dog team, and they were doing dog team rides with tourists and stuff. Anyway, this A-star went up there, and the first one, and it was flat light, the first helicopter tipped over, <coughs> and but surprisingly didn't hurt anybody very seriously. But it was upside down. They sent another one full of people again up to find Joe Bob and find out what's going on and do this other tour. They went up there and they they got kind of near that other helicopter, but they crashed. 
Then they loaded up another helicopter full of people, sent it up there, and it crashed. So fortunately, those people and and uh, Coast Guard or whoever the rescuers <coughs> didn't weren't going to go because it was so flat. But anyway, those people managed to gather up and hooey up together and uh, survive the night, you know, and took care of some minor injuries that some anybody had, but they weren't bad. And then finally, the next day, they started getting them. But pretty crazy. Huh? When it's that flat light, it's, uh, it's bad news. I remember one of when I was first working for BLM Aviation Division, one of our more uh, older pilot, you know, a, a good pilot, uh, went up by the Happy Valley on the pipeline, and it was flat light, and they crashed that helicopter up there. Fairchild 1100. But it didn't hurt them bad. They just kind of. You can ruin your day taxiing too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, people go off the runways and stuff, don't they? Run right. taxi to a firm. Yeah. We talked. Uh, we we had a presentation down at Sun and it was about some of those kind of issues. Time and taxiing off the runway and flat light. Be hard on equipment. Well, I think we're probably used you all up. <laughs> but thank you for coming, you guys. And uh, Marshall, myself, will be here. Marshall does these, has done a lot of great stuff with the airplane, and it's under uh, uh, Air Route 66 guys. Yeah, all small, all small letters and no spaces. Air Route 66 guys on Facebook. No. No, on YouTube. YouTube. You got to search it on YouTube. You'll never find it otherwise. Yeah. But anyway, there's a lot of cool stuff there if you want to check it out. He, he's done an amazing job. He was aboard on that one. You, every now and then you'll see him. That's that 360, you know, that you just, you do whatever you want with it. Look down, look up, look sideways. You know, you can look back at your plane. Pretty cool stuff. <laughs>